I really appreciate Pastor Burzens letting me even do this. So, uh, my sermon is called Our God Provides, and it's not just about providing for uh, me and the things that I've been doing, but even providing for other people around us, especially in things like salvation and providing churches and things like that for them to go to. So, before I, before I really get into all that, I just, you know, I have to tell everybody just quick history in case anybody's not quite sure things that have been happening um, in, in my life. So most, thing, most of you know I was engaged to Angelica Kim uh, in January 2017, and uh, she lives in Korea, and uh, it was in February of that same year that I filed for what's called a K-1 visa so that I would be able to basically bring her over here and marry her, right? So that's the whole goal, to marry her, right? Um, and, you know, we actually were thinking that the government was quick, and so we thought we could get this thing done, like May, maybe June. I mean, surely the government's fast, right? But uh, it's a two-part process. The first part, you, get a, you do a petition, okay, in order to petition for your fiancé. The second part, the fiancé, or they call him the beneficiary, applies for the actual visa. So the first part was finished very quickly in May on the 27th. Like, not, not fast at all. It was so slow. And uh, the second step uh, actually had to take place in Korea because we have to deal with the embassy and everything. It was going to include like m a whole bunch of forms. I mean, I had to prepare a whole bunch of stuff here before I even went. Uh, birth certificates, family certificates, police certificates. Not because she did anything wrong now, okay? They just, they just require it. And also, uh, medical exams, which included vaccinations, and uh, finally the interview at the embassy. Um, now, in order to even start that process, we had to get what they call a packet three letter, all right? And that's basically from the embassy saying, okay, you can begin your application now. And usually for most people, that's a two to three week from the end of the petition approval in or until the time the fiance actually gets that, two to three weeks. Uh, so we're thinking, well, probably June 14th, approximately, we can go to Korea and we'll have this paper and we can just start the process and we'll be done quickly, right? Well, it didn't exactly work out that way. Actually, that letter, well, I thought it was a letter. It actually ended up being an email, but <laughs> the letter took a month and a half to come, okay? So that's where we're at right now. And so we both arrived in Korea. You know, she was living in Kazakhstan at the time. And I was here, and we both arrived in Korea on the same day, on June 14th. And uh, that's really where, where uh, everything kind of begins. And um, before, you know, before I start talking about how God provided in our um, marriage and providing for the, the place where we could be and any visas that were necessary, I want to talk about how God provided for um, a church for us. He provided for... Uh, opportunities to win so many people to the Lord, and how, I mean, there was no doubt that his hand was working in so many of these situations. I mean, it was just impossible to ignore uh, his, his working. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, is the soul winning. And uh, so let me just read a couple of verses. I think everybody in here is a soul winner, but just to remind us, you know, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And so just, you know, if we want to be wise, then we're going to win souls. However, it's not just about being wise. There's actually a command that Jesus gave us in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So, of course, while we were in Korea, you know, this is something we wanted to do. We wanted to basically preach the gospel to as many people as we could and, uh, you know, we, we came across three different locations, really, is, is what we focused on for the soul winning. One of them was mostly for foreigners, well, we thought. We'll get to that in a minute. We thought it was going to be foreigners, okay? And this is a place called Itaewon, which is, if you know, Seoul is like this, and down to the south, you have this district in the area. It's called Itaewon. It's right near a U.S. military base. A lot of foreigners gather around there. A lot of strange foreigners, I might add. Uh, I nicknamed it Ipyantaewon. Pyante means pervert. Uh, so, yeah, so you see some pretty weird things walking down the sidewalk. So, uh, and then the other place was Yangju, which is north of Seoul, and this is where the church is that we were attending. The church is called Emmanuel Baptist Church, 
It was, um, the pastor is Barry Hoffman. Some of you might know him. Uh, he, I'm not sure if he still is, but he was supported by Faithful Word for a while as a missionary in Korea. He's a soul winner. The church is King James only. You know, it's a non-dispensational church. It's a good church. I mean, we may not agree on everything, but we can agree on the basics. Yeah. We can go out and preach the gospel together. And uh, so it's about 18 miles uh, from Seoul. And I think one of the things I really noticed in that church was that people were just excited. You know, they were, they really loved their church. They, they loved the, vi- you know, when visitors come, they, everybody's greeting, you know, they're sharing food with people. It's, it's just the way it is there. And uh, we even had people d- drive one, between one and three hours to get to this church every week. That's a long, I mean, I thought driving up here was long, but, but like two to three hours, that's a long ways. And they have toll roads, by the way. And uh, probably 10 to $20 just to get to church one way. So, uh, and also just to mention this, the preaching is in English and Korean. So uh, there was a, a church that we had gone to originally where it was just in Korean. And Angelica had her laptop translating for me. She'd like type up and translate. That didn't work out very well. I mean, it worked okay, but it was kind of hard. So, yeah, we decided like this is a much, much better situation right here. Um, so that, that's, one, that's the second place where we were able to go soul winning. And the third place was just in daily life. And I know, I think everybody was here at the beginning of this year when Pastor Burzins was doing these soul winning challenges. And we had one where it was, you know, just you got to try to talk to some one person every day. You know, they can say, I don't want to talk to you, but you just got to try at least one person. And, um, you know, in, in, in my trip to Korea, there was not a day that went by where we did not have that chance. Uh, we had a, a just regular acquaintances, people you see. And then the really common one that was really easy to do was taxi drivers because, I mean, they really can't kick you out. You know, the, the law says they have to take you, you know, so, and really we only had two or three that, that would actually get angry and just like say, shut up or whatever, you know, I don't want to hear this. Most of them either just didn't talk, you know, they just let you talk and you're just talking to them, preaching the whole gospel, you know, and they're listening, but they're just trying to ignore you, you know. And then the other ones who were actually, you know, would participate in the conversation, they were interested in hearing. And uh, so... I mean, that was just amazing opportunity that because, I mean, I live in America, so I don't really use taxis, and I never even thought about that as a good opportunity. But uh, the thing, of course, you have to fight in that is the flesh. You know, sometimes you're thinking, oh, not another taxi driver. He's not even going to say anything. But we just, you know, try to do it anyways. So those were the locations that we were uh, planning to go to, uh, and we did go to. And uh, let me just tell you about what we thought it was going to be like, okay, because we had preconceived idea you know, Korea's like this or like that, because uh, Angelica had been able to do a little bit of soul winning in Korea previously, and what she found was that she didn't think the people were very receptive, okay? They didn't seem to really want to talk, but as I show you some of these things, you're going to see, like, that was wrong, totally wrong, and it's it's just like what we tend to do when we go to a certain place where it's like, oh, well, you know, that city, they're they're just not going to listen. You know, we know one person or we know one thing that happened there, and so we just judge the whole city by just a couple of people we know or something like that. You know, we have to be very, very careful because every person has their own free will and they have their own thoughts and their own mind. Yeah. So we have to give everybody the same kind of opportunity, not just judge them by their appearance, you know. Good. So, uh, and the other thing that uh, was different in Korea is that you, you really can't go door to door. Not because it's illegal, but because everybody lives in, you know, 25, 30-story apartment buildings, and the apartments have, you know, key-coded locks, swipe locks, and everyone has a guard. So, <laughs> uh, what they call it, it's like an old, older guy. They're all older men, and they're very grumpy, generally, and uh, they don't just let you in. Uh, we did try once. It didn't work. <laughs> and uh, so... But because of how big Seoul is, it's a city of, I mean, just the main part is 10 million people. If you go out a little bit further, it's 12 million. And if you take in a larger section, it's 23 million people. Okay, so there's people on the street, all right? Not, most people don't have vehicles. And so you can just meet people on the street, stop them, try to talk to them. And it's not like they're always in a rush and they won't stop and talk to you. So it was kind of a different way like that. Now, don't misunderstand me. We were not holding up signs saying repent or perish, okay? 
That's not what we were done. We would just, you know, just like you would the door, try to hand people a church invitation and try to talk to them, right? So uh, let me just tell you, you know, I told you we had this preconceived idea about how, uh, how it was going to be in Korea, and we really thought that the foreigners were going to be the ones who were going to listen when we preached the gospel to them. And so we went to Itaewon, and we're thinking, like, let's just talk to foreigners. We're pretty much ignoring the Koreans. You know, don't even bother talk to them. You know, they were not going to listen. Yeah, we didn't get anybody saved. Like, no one got saved that first time when we went out there. We talked to a few people, but we had no salvations. And so, I mean, that was kind of disappointing because, you know, we were out there for like two or three hours. That's a long time to have no salvations. And uh, we had, it was Angelica, me, and Angelica's friend, Sarah. We were kind of showing her how to go soul winning. And that was kind of a disappointing time for her to see, you know, first time really going out, seeing this. And she was hoping to have a salvation, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, a verse to remember because, you know, being here in Prescott Valley, we have days like that. We have weeks like that, <laughs> you know, where people do not want to listen. We don't have salvations, right? But the Bible says in Psalm 126, verse 6, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with them. Amen. So it will happen. It just doesn't happen every day. You know, the command is to preach the gospel. It isn't preach the gospel and you better get one person saved. Right. Yeah, I think some people think that and... They feel like, well, I gotta make somebody pray with me, you know? And you know, the person's not even, they didn't even believe. It's just like, just pray with me, man, just pray with me, you know? That's not the command. It's preach the gospel, and if they believe, you know, that's the salvation right there. So, uh, so that's what we had to remember. And, uh, you know, thankfully the very next day, we went to church, and we have soul winning between the services, and we had our first person saved, and it wasn't a foreigner, it was a Korean. <laughs> Korean person got saved, okay, so we're like, okay, maybe the Koreans are open to the gospel, you know, maybe they will listen. And it was actually a 14-year-old boy, and you know what, he was sitting between his two friends who were actually kind of mocking him, and he still got saved. God. That's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Like, they got up, and they were behind us trying to distract him, and this kid was just sitting up straight, you know, just listening and just, I mean, he was really attentive. It was, I was very surprised at how attentive he was. Um, he even was ignoring, you know, his phone and things like that, which is very uncommon in Korea, by the way. A lot of people are just looking at their phones the whole time, you know. So, very amazing, and we were very thankful for that. And uh, so, uh, we, uh, you know, the next time we were in Itaewon, we didn't just target the the foreigners this time. We targeted multiple, you know, anybody that we could. And we had another Korean saved who was 20 years old. So you can't say, well, you're just, you know, looking at children and they're just not smart enough to figure out that you're wrong. You know, no, this is a 20 year old and he's definitely thinking for himself and he got saved. And then we also, and this kind of shows you the, the, uh, uh, the diversity of Seoul is that we had three Nigerians saved. Okay. And this was just in like a, a, a back sidewalk that goes between a main street and a bus station. And so the people just walking back and forth there. So it's a very diverse group of people. But, uh, um, you know, it really just made us remember we, we have to give it to everybody. It's not just a certain group of people that we want to target. And I've heard many stories like that where some people have gone to target one group in a country as missionaries, and they realize, you know what, there's this other group. I need to preach to them too. I can't just target this group. We need to try to talk to everybody. And, you know, during that time, and, and this is something I think we always have to be reminded of, in that particular time when we were preaching the gospel, it's, we're on the street, right? It's not the door, and guess who came up and started disputing? An atheist. And no just seeking atheist comes up and starts disputing with you. These are militant people who, as we read in Psalm 14, 1, the Bible says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. This is the kind of guy that, we were, that I was dealing with. I mean, he just started walking up. Because I'm speaking to a man who was actually, I believe, saved and trying to help him with some other things, give him some other doctrines and stuff. And this atheist just begins to attack and he's blaspheming Jesus, you know, and asking just ridiculous questions that have obvious answers if you believe the Bible even a little bit. Um, 
But I want to encourage you with these two verses in 1 Corinthians 1 14 that when you run into people like this, just remember these verses. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. When these people begin to ask, you know, these doctrinal type questions, they're not even saved. There's no way they can understand this stuff. And they begin to scoff. And that's exactly what the guy did. I gave him a perfect answer for his question, and he just scoffs like, Pfft. well, that's ridiculous, you know. But he doesn't even believe in God anyways. And so, as Titus 3, 10 through 11 says, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he, is, he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So we don't want to spend a lot of time just arguing with these people, right? We give them a couple of answers and try to move on. And basically, the way I got rid of the guy was to say, look, you know, one day you're going to bow your knee before the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he's like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> so he'll remember that one day, you know. He's going to remember that I told him that when he does bow his knee to the Lord. And as sad as that is, I mean, I hope he gets saved one day, but right now he's not at all open. Now, so that's, you know, our, was our major introduction to soul winning. But the next thing I want to share with you is really showing how God was working to bring two particular people uh, so that they would be saved. Okay, and this was just an amazing story. So let me first tell you how they got saved, and then I'll tell you the backstory behind it that we found out. Okay, so this was at Emmanuel Baptist Church. We were actually, uh, after the church service, everyone kind of eats lunch together in like a cafeteria type area. And uh, generally, Angelica and I would sit across from each other so we could talk, right? But today, that day, for some reason, we were sitting next to each other. And, uh, and then this lady from the church brought two um, approximately, you know, freshman-aged, uh, college-aged girls and sat right in front of us. Well, Angelica began to speak to them in Korean, and uh, she found out right away that uh, neither one was saved. But she didn't share that with me, and so... <laughs> The girl across from me spoke English because she grew up in Los Angeles for several years. And this girl, her English was okay, but it wasn't good enough for me to be able to give the gospel to her. So Angelica's preaching the gospel in Korea to this girl. And uh, her name was Yerin, by the way. And this girl's name was Lynn, the one in front of me. And as I, you know, I didn't know that Lynn was not saved. I actually assumed that she was a church member who brought her friend to hear the gospel. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I assumed that, but that was my assumption. So I began to speak to her, you know, as though she was saved. And I kind of made some small talk and asked her, you know, what she was planning on doing. Was she going to be going to university or something like that? And she said, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm thinking about majoring in psychiatry because I want to help people. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of a weird thing to be majoring in as a Christian. I don't, most Christians aren't going to major in that. But I thought, well, maybe she, you know, let me just help her out a little bit. Maybe take her mind off that. So I said, well, you know, as a Christian, there's going to be a lot of professors that are going to try to dissuade you from Christianity in that thing. And your book is not going to give any credence to, to the Bible. It's going to downplay the Bible. You know, it's not going to say there's anything spiritual going on. Uh, and so I said, you know, you, you need to make sure, if you're really going to do this, you need to be really strong in what you believe because you are going to get fooled by these professors if you're not. You're just going to, yes, sir, that's, that's what I should believe, you know. So I asked her, you know, would you be able to stand up to your professor if he started criticizing the Bible and say, I don't believe you, you're wrong. You know, the Bible's right and you're wrong. She said, oh, I could never do that. Because she was more introverted in some ways. And uh, so, again, I'm still thinking she's a Christian, right? So I said, well, you know, there's one thing that really helped me to, you know, overcome a lot of my problems with speaking to people and speaking in front of strangers and things like that, and that is to start soul winning. And so I encourage her, you know, you, the church here does soul winning. You know, you sh if you come out, you don't have to start hard. You know, you can actually just literally hand an invitation to somebody at the church and say, hey, we'd love to have you come to church. If that's all you feel like you can do at that time, that, that's fine. And she's like, I don't know if I could do that. That'd be really hard. <laughs> Not even talking about talking to somebody, right? Just hand an invitation and say, hey, we'd love to have you at church. Okay, so that kind of shows you where she was really at in terms of her, her confidence. And so I just told her, you know, kind of told her my story and how that worked for me. And, and in telling her my story with that, she all of a sudden said, you know, I'm not actually sure if I'm going to heaven. And I'm like, whoa, what? You know, thinking this girl was saved the whole time. So it's like, well, you know, the Bible says you can know 
and it's not hard. Let me show you. So I reached around and grabbed my Bible, and I began to preach to her the gospel. And, I mean, it turns out that, like, she didn't understand even the concepts of, of eternal damnation. Like, she had Buddhism in her mind when it came to that, where when people die, their spirits just kind of, you know, are around. And so there are so many things to, some things to undo there, but she understood that, the gospel, and she believed it. You know, she called upon the Lord and was saved, along with her friend Yedin. Okay, both of them were saved right there. So that, I mean, that was just incredible right there. Just from knowing that particular part, that was amazing because, you know, she spoke English right across from me. She speaks pretty much Korean right across from me. Just perfect right there. Okay, that's pretty cool. However, when you hear the backstory, it's even more amazing because, you remember I told you I thought that Lynn was the one who was the member and had brought her friend, but it was the other way around. Yedin actually brought Lynn. And, uh, and Yedin was not a member, by the way, but she had gone to the church when she was about three or four years old. Now, remember, Yedin was not saved. And her parents, uh, you know, they had, were third generation Baptists. And, but yet their daughter was not saved. And six years prior to Yedin finally getting saved, uh, she had actually begun to dabble in the occult and in demonism and things like that. And she'd gotten really into this sort of thing, you know, all the music, the dark themes and things like that. And, you know, her parents were, had just been just horrified at this sort of thing, you know, because they're, they're Christian, they're actually saved, you know, not because they're Baptists, but because they believe on the Lord. And they didn't know what to do. And they were just praying for her and, you know, trying to consult with, with the pastors and find out, like, what should we do, you know? And um, so, but for whatever reason, and I think we know the reason. Yedin, within the, the couple weeks before she got saved, she had begun to desire to go back to that church. It, because she remembered as a child that that was a place of, of comfort for her, a, a good place. She remembered the good feelings from that church and how good of a time it was. And she just wanted to go back and see if she could kind of recover some of that for herself because she was living such a dark life, you know, and uh, being afflicted by evil spirits and things like that, like literally. And um, so she had brought her friend along. And it just so happened to be the exact day that we're there, right? And, you know, I, I don't have any doubt that, uh, that God worked that out in such a way that they would both have the opportunity to hear the gospel because he knew we were going to be there. He knew that, you know, he had two servants who were going to actually try to talk to these people if they knew they weren't saved, right? And he set them down right in front of us in the exact right order, so that we could talk to each other. I mean, that, that, that blew my mind. When I found that out, I was just like, what in the world? Are you serious? You know, does that even happen? You know? <laughs> so, um, and just to give you an update on, on like, uh, Lynn currently, uh, now this is not required for a baptism, just so you know, but they have, like, a discipleship class to catch up new believers on basic doctrines and things, and she's part of that now, you know. She's getting into the church. She's gone out soul winning with us. Um, and yet in, she lives further away, but she's been able to come sometimes too to the church and, you know, her life is definitely turning around from where it was. And uh, we actually went over and, and had a, a meal with her parents and things and they were very thankful for everything that had happened, you know, and, um, and the, the other thing that came out of this, which we, was totally unexpected to us, was how much it actually encouraged the members of the church there because, Remember I told you we were in a cafeteria and we happened to be near the exit door. And we were talking to these girls for about an hour. You know, we got our Bibles open and we're showing them. And the people know that these are guests. And so they know that we're giving them the gospel. And they saw this going on and they were actually, instead of being offended, like a lot of churches, church members might be like, what are these people doing? You know, for an hour preaching, what are they doing? Yeah. They were actually excited, and they were motivated to do the same sort of thing, you know, and to go out soul winning themselves and actually preach the gospel, not just try to hand things out or anything like that. And many people were actually preaching, but others, you know, had kind of reverted to just, you know, handing out stuff. And so, and we, we learned this uh, by, from the pastor's wife actually told us what had happened, you know, and how she'd had a lot of people come up to her and tell her how, you know, they had been greatly encouraged by this. And, um, and so even more ladies were coming out soul winning because of this sort of thing even, because they saw Angelica, you know, would go out and she was talking to these people. So 
a lot came out of that. I mean, talk about two birds, like three or four birds with one stone, I'm pretty sure, from that particular thing. Uh, so, I mean, we were just blown away by that particular situation. And uh, let me give you uh, another, another situation where God is working to bring us to be able to preach the gospel to a man that we met uh, like a month and a half prior. And he brought us across, all the way across the city of 10 million people, and we just happened to meet him in a back alley. Okay. <laughs> so there was a man who was a salesman, and we had been at this mall, and uh, we hadn't bought his stuff, but he was super nice to us. But we didn't buy anything from him. He worked for like 30 or 40 minutes to help us like try stuff on. And like, oh, well, don't think we're going to buy anything. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, we felt kind of bad about it, but we kind of forgot about him, you know. And uh, we hadn't preached in the gospel or anything there. But uh, we, had, we were in Itaewon, okay? So understand that the mall is like up here in Seoul, and you got to take about 20, 30-minute ride to get down to Itaewon from there, okay? Public, public transit. Long ways away. So we're in Itaewon, and that particular day, we kind of started at a different location in Itaewon. And as we're walking along, we came to a fork with three different paths. And I, I looked off to the left, and I'm looking at them all. I looked off to the left, and I thought I saw some foreigners. I'm like, let's go this way. There's some foreigners over here maybe we can talk to. And uh, so we went that way, and it was all Koreans. <laughs> and none of them actually would listen to us that particular time. So we kept walking. We get to the end of the road, and we're about to go turn right. And we, I turn around and see Angelica, and uh, looking for Angelica, and I see this guy who looks familiar. You know, I'm like, who is this guy? I know this guy. And she, and Angelica looks at him, and she knows instantly, you know, because she's smarter than I am. And she, she's like, oh, this is the guy. And he recognized us, too. So that was another interesting thing. Like, he recognized us. And um, I guess he would after 40 minutes, and they didn't buy your stuff. You'd be like, oh, I know those people. <laughs> Wasted my time. <laughs> so he offered to buy us coffee and tea. He's like, come with me. I'm going to get a coffee right now. You want to come with me? It's like, okay, sure. <laughs> so we go there, and, you know, he's like, so what are you guys doing? And, and, and this is all in Korean. And uh, Angelica was able to preach him the gospel, right? And now, he didn't get saved yet. So let me just spoil it. He didn't get saved yet, okay? But we have ongoing meet. We're going to meet with him again when we go back. We already have, like, it planned and everything. But the funny thing was that this guy, all right, he listened very attentively. And he listened so attentively that when he went back, he told us this later, when he went back to his shop, he told his coworker, man, I had this soul cleansing experience today. Like, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I'm like, I don't know, maybe he did understand. Maybe he really, maybe he got saved, I don't know. My guess is that he was enlightened to understand, you know, what happened and, uh, or what, what we were saying. And though he hasn't yet decided, you know, he's close. And uh, the funny thing was that this guy really didn't have a religion but he claimed to be a Catholic because his great aunt was a nun. <laughs> Therefore, he's Catholic. So, like, okay, that's, that's kind of weird. Like, there's no, like, I don't think your family tree works on that one. So, yeah, it was kind of weird. But, uh, but th I mean, this man, you know, he, he, we have another opportunity to give him the gospel. And he's, you know, he's very open to us. I don't know why, but he was just very open and very friendly towards us and willing to listen to the things we have to say. So, and just real quickly, uh, let me just say that we had, uh, let's see, one, two, uh, six other Koreans saved uh, through August 27th of, of that time period. Uh, more Koreans, and some of them that were up I at the church, and uh, another one was in, in Itaewon area. And during that time, as far as I know, we didn't have any, any foreigners saved. You know, just Koreans again. You know, more Koreans. What in the world? You know, what's, what's up with all these Koreans? You know? So, <laughs> but we were very thankful for that. And while some people may scoff, you know, four of them were probably about the age of 10, you know, 9 or 10. And I have no doubt that they got saved. I know some people doubt that. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of children that tend to walk around these apartment complexes. And their parents are just, you know, watching TV or whatever inside. So they apparently don't care that they're out here. So let's, let's talk to them, you know. And uh, a lot of the times the kids are open and willing to listen. It's, it's almost like, um, well, I'm not sure if I would hear that. 
I'm not sure how to compare it to here, but uh, sometimes like Hispanic families are very open to allowing their kids to hear. And it sometimes seems to be like that, sort of, in Korea. Um, so, and now I have, I, have a, I have three more examples where God worked in allowing us to give the gospel to these people. And one of them, okay, don't, don't think I'm getting all Pentecostal here, but God, it's almost like he literally spoke to us through his word, okay? <laughs> but it was, it was almost like he was right there speaking to us, okay? So that's, uh, let me tell you this one. Uh, we had gotten on this bus, and we had to sit all the way in the back, and at the very back was a girl who was a middle school, uh, probably middle school, elementary school girl, and we sat down next to her, and Angelica's right next to her, and we're, you know, we're both thinking, you know, we should probably just try to talk to her a little bit, because the bus ride's like 20 minutes, so let's try to talk to her. But we, we waited three or four minutes, and then this girl, she opens up her backpack, and she pulls out this, this, this notebook, and she pulls a piece of paper out, and here's what the paper said. The paper said, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. <laughs> and literally, it was on this paper, and we're just like, I think we should talk to her, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, you know, Angelica began speaking to her in Korean, and, uh, you know, was preached the whole gospel to her, and the girl, like, she understood, and she, I'm not 100% sure that she actually truly believed, because she wasn't willing, because her grandmother was there, she wasn't willing to actually call upon the Lord, uh, however, Angelica was very careful, you know, to explain to her, you know, if you truly believe on the Lord, you ought to call upon him, and tell him what you believe, you know, of course he knows your heart, and he knows what you believe, but, you know, ideally, she, you know, we wanted to call upon the Lord. So though we don't count her for sure as saved, I mean, that was just like the weirdest situation ever. And she was very open. And uh, I mean, just, just the weird things that God put in our path, you know. Just th these are just day-to-day -day things. I mean, we were not even attempting to go soul winning at that time. It's just not even an attempt. So, you know, it's a real encouragement. I hope it's an encouragement to all of us here to just be aware, you know, of, of what's going on around us and to not be too busy. And of course there it was easier because you're riding the bus anyways. You know, you, you gotta wait 20 minutes. What are you gonna do? <laughs> so, uh, and I just have two more. So after I finish these two, two examples, I'm, I'm gonna tell you about what happened with our marriage situation and how God provided in that. So the, the, the next one was uh, that we wanted to take basically pre-wedding traditional Korean clothing pictures, okay, at a palace, you know, like a Korean king palace, dress up like a queen and a king. Of course, it's kind of weird because I'm basically a foreigner, so, you know, I don't look like a Korean guy, but anyways, so usually when you do this, you get a lady, she's, she, they term her a, a hanbok lady. Hanbok means Korean clothing, and what she does is she comes along with you, and she basically makes sure the clothing is nice and not wrinkled, everything's turned correctly. And uh, so we, we, at the last minute, we found this lady to go with us. And we were thinking, you know, we, we really want to give her the gospel, and, uh, but we couldn't really do it during the photography because you, you got a three hour time period and you can't really just be wasting the, I'm not say wasting the time, that's a bad term. You, you don't want, you want to have a better time period to do it in where she's going to be focused, okay? So what I told Angelica was, let's offer her dinner afterward. You know, we'll buy her lunch. She can come eat with us. And so she was gladly accepted that because it was like three, three o'clock and we hadn't eaten lunch yet. So everybody was hungry. And so she came with us. We found, it took us four times to find the right restaurant. And it was the perfect place. Quiet and no music, which just never happens in Korea. You, sometimes they have like the worst music playing because I don't think they understand the lyrics because it's in English. And like... I mean, yeah, it's terrible. It's awful music. Stuff you would censor usually here. But anyways, so it was very quiet. And um, after we had eaten, you know, Angelica began to preach the gospel to her. And this lady, she was 50 years old. And if you know anything about Korean culture, a lot of times people, the older they get, the less likely they are in that particular culture to accept anything a young person says. 
And th that can happen here too. Sure. But especially there, there's often a matter of pride yeah. uh, thinking that like, oh, who are you, you know? And, uh, and there's a lot of respect for elder people as well in many cases. So many times young people don't even try, you know, to talk, they're afraid to talk to the elder, you know? And so, but this lady was very open and uh, she had gone to a Presbyterian church and, but she did not know, you know, the way to heaven. And so we preached her the gospel and like right there in that, in that uh, restaurant, she received the Lord as her savior right there. And not only did she hear the gospel, there was nobody else in the restaurant as customer except about four women who worked in the restaurant and they were just like shelling vegetables and cutting stuff and it was like quiet. I'm pretty sure they heard every single thing that was said. So, you know, they also got to hear the gospel, just, you know, just ambient noise for them to listen to what, you know, was being said. And, uh, you know, that lady, she was extremely grateful and happy to know that she was saved at that time. We were able to give her a good Bible. Um, and I think there was another book that we were able to give her as well. Uh, and uh, we will probably meet her, you know, obviously we'll meet her in heaven one day, but we plan to probably talk to her again sometime when we're over there and uh, see how things are going with her because she actually shared things about her family with us. You know, she became open to sharing things with us and she was just very thankful for everything that she had received right there. <coughs> And now, the, the last story here, I know I'm telling you a lot of stories, I'm sorry, there, there's just so many things that have happened, and this was, uh, I call it the Yongjin story. Uh, Yongjin, I know this sounds really weird, but he's my personal trainer, okay? I only had a personal trainer because Angelica really wanted me to, and you know, I'm not glad I did, okay? She wanted me to like, just make sure everything's right, and so, <laughs> So we actually found this personal trainer while we were going to get ice cream. And <laughs> we were on our way to get ice cream. <laughs> and we, we just like walked past this place and we're like, oh wait, hey, we're looking for a place. Let's see if they have somebody that speaks English. <laughs> they did, you know? And uh, so we, my, his name is Yongjin. And um, you know, one of the things I struggled with was like, because his, his English is okay, but it's very, uh, it's pretty weak. Right? And to be able to just start a conversation, especially, you know, that he's not thinking about, is very difficult uh, to get in the right context of everything. And uh, so I've been kind of trying to figure out, well, how am I going to do this? Maybe I can invite him out for lunch or something and just have Angelica talk to him. But one day at the end of the, the training session, he, you know, I signed my name on the, the sheet of paper saying, yeah, hey, we had this lesson. And he looked at my name and said, isn't that a Bible name? And I'm like, yeah, it is a Bible name. You know, it's like three different people in, in the Bible, three or four or something like that. Actually, there's more than that. And so he's like, yeah, yeah. Do you read the Bible? And I said, yeah, I, I try to read it every day. And that's my goal. You know, I don't always succeed, but that's my goal is to read it every day. He's like, really? So you believe everything in the Bible? Yeah, I do, actually. I believe it's the Word of God. And he said, well, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. And he started talking about, like, the Red Sea, cro you know, the Red Sea party. He's like, oh, it's amazing, you know? And uh, so I knew that he wasn't uh, really, you know, religious. And uh, I found out apparently his mother was Buddhist, but he didn't hold to that at all. And uh, I mean, the closest he got to religion was basically the, the folk religion where they're sort of praying to their ancestors, you know, yearly. At this point, it's more of a cultural thing. But they, I mean, it, it still is idolatry, but it has just become a cultural thing to people. They just do it and it's like, oh, whatever, you know. And uh, so I asked him, you know, what did he know about Christianity? And his only really relation to Christianity was when he was in the military because military is required for all men in Korea. And he had gone to several services under a chaplain. And he said, yeah, he had a lot of good advice in there. I got a lot of good advice from that. <laughs> so I don't know who the guy was, but apparently not very into doctrine or preaching the gospel. So I said, well, you know, there's, there's a really important point of Christianity. It's the main point. Can I tell you about it? He's like, yeah, I want to hear about the main point of Christianity. So ever so slowly and carefully, in many times repeating and trying to reword things so he would understand it, I gave him the whole gospel. And the one, one major thing he took away from it was the idea of the free gift, right? And he was just all about that free gift. Like, so he's giving me, so it's, 
it's free, right? So it can't be taken away, right? Yeah, it can't be taken away, you know? And, uh, but he didn't understand enough to put his faith in Christ because, I mean, I just couldn't explain it in a way in English where he could really understand everything that he needed to. And so I, I, I told him, you know, hey, you know, let's set up a lunch. We'll set up a lunchtime and I'll have Angelica come and explain this to you. You know, would you like that? He's like, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to understand, you know, more. And uh, so we set that up and it was just basic lunch at some restaurant and she was able to preach to him the whole gospel and right there in that restaurant, he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I mean, that was just, it's such a blessing, you know, to actually have like a personal trainer who you got saved, you know. And it's still, you know, it's difficult to bring up topics just again because of like context switching and things, but he's been asking me recently, like before I left, he was asking me about like evolution and creation and things like that. And I was able to explain some of that to him. And we, we plan on giving him some DVDs and things to, to kind of help him a little bit more with that. But, uh, you know, he's definitely becoming interested in those sort of things. And that's, I believe, because he's saved. You know, he actually has the Spirit of God in him. And he's, you know, he's still living, you know, doing some things in life that he shouldn't be doing. You know, it's kind of the, the mentality of a lot of young people in Korea is that you kind of try to live as much as you can while you're young, and then when you're old, then you'll move up to, you know, some retire, retire out in the country or whatever, um, not really thinking about what is really important in life, you know. So, uh, you know, just pray for him if you get a chance. His name is Yongjun. And, um, so that, that kind of concludes the, the stories that I wanted to tell you about how God worked to bring many people to salvation, you know, through us and... Uh, just, I want to encourage you that, you know, when, when you have a chance to give somebody the gospel, try not to pass it up. Amen. You know, you never know when you're going to have that chance again. So, I want to read you a few verses here. Um, in Proverbs, before I go to the next thing, it's just to kind of prepare you for what I'm going to tell you. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, the Bible says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. And it says in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. And I'm not going to reread Psalm 139 uh, as we read at the beginning. But in Psalm 139, you have, you know, the Lord is talking about how, I mean, he's literally like surrounding us. He's besetting us before and behind. You know, he knew us in the womb. He knows everything. There's, there's nothing that's going to hide what's happening in our lives from him. And there's nothing that can prevent him from you know, doing things in our lives. And so, uh, I mean, even, no matter how dark things get, you know, God is, God is there, he's working, you know, especially as it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. When we're doing the things that he wants us to do, you know, for example, Jesus said, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing so that God is going to be guiding our steps in the right way. And like Proverbs 16, 9 said, you know, this is the way I kind of feel what happened with, with me, right? So I have this goal. My goal is to get married, right? To Angelica Kim, okay? And so my heart devised this certain way. <laughs> this is how we're going to do it, right? However, the Lord directed my steps differently, <laughs> okay? However, you know, God is... I believe he's all for this particular marriage, right? He want, you know, he that findeth a, a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So he's just giving us a different path. And so let me now kind of explain to you and show you how and uh, what's kind of transpired. So remember I told you that that packet three didn't come till a month and a half later, that letter that we needed to actually apply for everything. And... Uh, it finally came July 14th, and uh, remember, we got it to Korea June 14th, so a whole month later, it's, it's finally coming, and it, like I said, it was an email. What in the world? I mean, I, I thought it was taking a while in the mail, but no, they just, <laughs> I didn't know email was slow. So, <laughs> right after we got it, we scheduled the medical exam, we scheduled the interview, and we began the process of getting that Kazakhstan police certificate, and uh, uh, just quickly, I got to tell you about this police certificate. So we went down to the embassy because we're like, yeah, that'd be the best way to get it, right? Through the embassy. We should just be able to get it very quickly. 
And uh, we applied and everything. It was all in Russian, so Angelica did everything. So, because <laughs> she speaks like three languages. And so, uh, she started calling. Angelica started calling them like once a week. And after like the second week, the lady at the embassy said, look, it's not coming for four to eight months. Why do you keep calling me? <laughs> and we, we were like, whoa, what? Wait, wait, say that again. Four to eight, what? Months, you know? And she said, yeah, I, I told you guys it was going to take that long. And we're like, no, you didn't say it was going to take four to eight months, because if we'd, if we'd heard that, we would have never tried to do it this way, right? Uh, apparently, I read it, and it goes like, I mean, it's the most ridiculous pathway to get a request to who it needs to go. It goes through like every ministry of the government to finally get to the one that you wanted to go to. And then it goes back the same way to get to the embassy. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So. Needless to say, we tried a different way. We basically got her family in Kazakhstan to, to, get, to try to get that for us. And even that took forever. Um, so, I mean, just crazy things. To just slow everything down. And, you know, at the time, we're thinking, that, what is wrong with this? You know, this takes forever. What's going on? But, you know, we didn't, we didn't see where our, our steps were being directed. So, uh, on July 24th, you know, 10 days later, we did the medical exam, okay? Now, this is something we were worried about. I, I know, I think I had requested prayer for this. I don't know if this is in the bulletin or, or if I just mentioned it to certain people, but uh, a problem that we found was the vaccinations. And, um, you know, for a while, we thought Angelica had everything, um, but we were worried because by this time in our lives, you know, neither of us believe that vaccines are something you should do. Uh, we believe, you know, you're polluting your body, the temple of the, of the Lord, and, you know, we should keep ourselves pure, and there's so many impure things, even baby parts in these vaccines. It's just wicked things. Uh, and just think about the people behind them, you know, behind these vaccines. And so, you know, we had no, no question that we weren't going to take these. Um, but what we found out is that if you don't take it, you have to put in a waiver that could add four months onto the process as they adjudicate your waiver like is this for real do you really believe this you know as though they can look down and say do you really believe this i don't know <laughs> uh remember only god can see the heart right so uh, so we were worried about that before we went to the exam and you know it turns out yeah she was missing two vaccines and the doctor said well you got to have a chicken pox and a tdap because you know you might you might infect somebody in america and it's better for herd immunity. And, you know, he's throwing out all these terms and stuff. So we said, well, you know, we are going to file for religious exemption. He said, oh, okay. Are you guys Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> and we're like, no, no, we're not. We're, we're, we actually go to a Baptist church. He's like, really? That's interesting. Okay. Huh. Uh, he couldn't figure that out, you know. I was like, oh, what in the world? And so, um, you know, as soon as we got out of that particular doctor's office, um, Angelica had a couple more exams she had to do, a little, few more tests. And so I'm just kind of waiting for her to finish. And that doctor comes out and he comes over and starts talking to me, you know, and he, he has really good English. And so we're able to talk very well. And he's like, yeah, you know, I kind of wish I had a religious conviction about this stuff because I hate getting these vaccines all the time. Every five years, he's got to get an MMR vaccine. And that's, that's one of the really bad ones, right? The MMR. So, and I think there's a few more because he's a doctor. And they don't allow philosophical convictions, apparently, in Korea. It has to be a religious conviction. So as I began to talk to him, you know, found out he was a Presbyterian, went to a Presbyterian church. And so and I wanted to just check his salvation. And as I began to talk to him, I was very surprised. It seemed like the guy was saved, you know. And one of the things you have to learn about the Presbyterians, I don't know if it's the same here, but in Korea, the big thing that they preach is that if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. Like, that's because there's a lot of people that commit suicide over there. So I don't know if they think, like, saying that is going to, like, keep people from committing suicide or what. But, you know, obviously they're perverting the gospel by saying that. Okay, they're, they're adding works into this. They're, uh, it's not the gospel of grace. And so uh, I, I wanted to ask him that. I was like, well, what do you think about suicide? If you commit suicide, do you think you can go to hell? He's like... Ah, nah, that, that's the sin like everything else. You know, and the Bible says that, you know, God, Christ paid for the sins, and so it's just by faith. You know, so that, that was like, whoa, this guy is like, 
is he a Presbyterian? You know, is he really a Presbyterian? So a lot of times you'll find people who are saved in other denominations too. You always just have to take it at the individual level, you know. And so we were surprised at that. We left him with a couple of, uh, with a booklet uh, from the church up there. They have a book. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but the church is actually planted by Lancaster Baptist, uh, Paul Chapel. maybe you've heard of him, but they have a little gospel booklet. And so we left that with him in Korean, you know, so you could kind of read it and, um, you know, kind of understand fully, more fully where we're coming from. And we had to leave at that point. But uh, another opportunity to preach the gospel. And what's really weird is that, that that hospital is not actually where we were supposed to go. We... <laughs> We actually went to the wrong hospital for our, our scheduled medical exam. And um, we actually went to the wrong building to start with. Totally wrong hospital. A- and it wasn't even the right building for the wrong hospital. And when we went to the wrong building for the wrong hospital, we were looking around and we meet this doctor coming in. And we're like, ah, you know, Sunsingim, do you know where this place is? And he's like, uh, yeah, that's like way on the other side of Seoul. You know? I'm like, really? What? And he's like, yeah. We do have one that's just a few blocks away, but, well, let me call him and see if I can get you guys in. This is like some random doctor, you know, and he just calls and he's like, yeah, yeah, okay, we got you in now. Okay, go ahead, you know, here it is, just walk through here and go over there. And this does not happen. I mean, you don't just get a walk-in for a visa medical center. You have to have an appointment, but, I mean, for whatever reason, this is the way it worked out. I'm not sure if we were supposed to talk to that doctor, you know, and, and... I don't know what the deal was with that, but it's a very weird thing that happened and a blessing that we didn't have to like wait longer. Not that it mattered in the end, but, uh, you know, very, very strange. Angelica was thinking like, is this guy like an angel at the time? Is this doctor real? I mean, is this, is this a real doctor here? Is able to get, just get us in like that? You know, what happened? Um, so... Then, so that was July 24th, and we actually had our interview set on August 1st at the time at the embassy, but we had to move it, and we had to mo- the only opening was a whole month later, August 28th, right? So we're like waiting around all this time, and, and so uh, when we finally, we finally got into that interview, it was actually really, really easy, we thought. You know, we're just sitting there for two hours before they finally called us up, but, you know, otherwise it was very easy, and... Uh, the only thing that we were missing was, guess what? The Kazakh police certificate. Yeah, you got it right. We're still missing that. And we were kind of hoping they would ignore it. But no, they said, no, you got to have that. And, uh, but that was the only thing. Until a day later, they called us and said, oh, we forgot to ask you a required question. <laughs> and they didn't tell us what the question was. So I really don't know if, if it had anything to do with the vaccines. Or the one thing that I know that they forgot to ask us, or I never heard them ask, was, do you guys actually plan to marry? They never bothered asking us that or checking any paperwork that, you know, like saying, yeah, we're going to marry or anything like that, which hard to believe they would not ask that, but they didn't. And so, but the thing is at the time, you know, we had an appointment to go there. So it was a particular time that we requested, but they said for the next time you have to come here to answer this question, but you can only come on Wednesdays and it's only like from this time to this time. That's kind of constricting, you know, because we do have other things to do, you know, and so we honestly never got there. We have never gone back and got that question figured out yet. So I still don't know what they, <laughs> they were going to ask us. But uh, so that was, that was August 28th. And so overall, you know, we weren't that worried about it. We were just going to go answer that question. And once the Kazakh stuff came and it was going to be visa in hand, right? And we're, we're coming here and we're going to... Not the gold whatever place, <laughs> the, the, the lake, not the lake. We were going to go to, you know, get married down in the Mesa area. But then this is when we had some really, some bad news. On September 5th, um, Angelica's mother was um, admitted into the hospital for long term. And I can't go into everything about that, but suffice it to say it, it's long term. And, and the, the, the really bad part about that was that she had just opened a clothing store like two weeks before. And um, at the time when we found out about this, we did not know the financial, the actual financial situation that was going to be involved in this. But 
three days later, you know, after Angelica and her sister and uh, one of her, one of her friend, her mom's friends examined like the books and things, they realized that uh, first of all that lease was a two-year lease, and uh, that the total owed was something like sixty thousand dollars, and then there was tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt that nobody knew about, and multiple, I mean, there were, there were other things involved in this, but let's just keep it at the financial level. Uh, and the thing about Korea is the bankruptcy is extremely difficult. And honestly, we were a little bit uh, hesitant about it anyways, because just, you know, the Bible says, pay that thou owest and things like that. And, you know, we were kind of hesitant about even doing that. But then when you look at the system itself, if, if you fail to prove that you're actually bankrupt, they will charge you an extra 20% on top of what you already owe, plus your lawyer fees, because you gotta have a lawyer to do it. So, you know, that could be, you know, multi tens of thousands of dollars more on top of what's already owed, plus you wouldn't get bankruptcy. And the thing also about the bankruptcy was that uh, the house that they were in would be, you know, taken away, or at least a lien put against it until it was sold, and any money that would pay any of these debts would come off of that, that amount. And there wasn't any other income for the family, okay, at the time. So all these problems, you know, these, this sounds kind of bad, right? Uh, what, so what's going to happen, you know? Well, and not only what's going to happen with the financially, but what about our marriage, you know? So how, are we just going to leave them here? Or like just, yeah, you guys figure it out, you know? Well, so on September 12th, we, we, we realized what we needed to do. And so here, here's our plan of action. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Uh, first of all, the house that they're in, in the middle of Seoul, you know, it, it had to be sold because it's very expensive to live in, in Seoul. And so they, they actually sold the house already. And uh, using part of the money, they were able to pay off credit card debts and things like that. And with the rest of it, they, they used to move up to, uh, you know, a suburb of Seoul. And we'll get into that in a minute, what happened with that. Now, the suburb of Seoul that they were first looking at was a place called Namyangju, okay? And this is what her sister was thinking about moving to. Now, Namyangju, you don't have to know exactly where it is, but it's two hours from the church, okay? It's even further than the current place they were living. So Angelica and I were like, that's not good, you know, because we want them to go to the church. And so, you know, she brought up to them, hey, what about Yangju, which is where the church is? You know, maybe we should look for an apartment up there. And at first they were like, I don't know, should we? Yeah, we'll look at it. Okay, we'll just see maybe what's up there. And the whole family actually drove up there. We got some appointments to look at apartments. And we found the one apartment where literally everybody, like her grandma, her sister, her and, and her, and I'm not sure about her brother, but they were all in unanimous agreement that this was where we need to live. So now to understand like how important that is, you have to understand that Angelica, for the last several years, has been praying for her family to go to be where that church is, to be able to attend that church. And they had not done it. You know, it was kind of like Jonah. Jonah, you know, he knows what God wants him to do. I mean, God literally directly told him what to do, and he's like, I don't want to do it. I'm going to, you know, going to Tarshish, you know. And, and what did God do, right? He had to chastise him. He had to bring bad things in his life. And he got swallowed by a fish, a whale, right? I don't think that was happy. He said, out of the belly of hell cried I. I don't think that was a very good, <laughs> good place to be. But only after the bad things happened in his life did he finally say, you know, in Jonah 3, when, when God said, arise, go into Nineveh, he's, Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. Okay? And that's what the family finally had to go through. You know, we were hoping that they would just choose to go up there, but all these bad things had to come in. And I'm not even telling you half the bad things, Okay? A lot of bad things happened, and the family is, you know, turning more towards God. And just to clarify, her family is saved, okay? Her, her immediate family is saved, okay? So I don't want to confuse anybody here. But they were not going to good churches, or not even going to church at all. So it had been her prayer for a long time that they would. And, you know, God worked it out. You know, he had to do it the hard way, but he made it so that they had to go up to where that church is, you know, and we were very thankful for that, um, you know, and we're okay with whatever God chose 
the situation and how he chose to make it happen. And the final plan of action was that, this, this, that the store would have to be managed by Angelica and her sister. Um, there's just, there's not really anyone else who can, who can do it. I mean, Angelica has the financial management training to be able to, to handle that sort of thing. And, and her sister has the, I guess, the fashion sense, if you want to call it that. <laughs> I don't know. She's able to like know what's the next fashion to go buy and things like that. So they're able to do that. Um, but then the question is like, well, what about our marriage, right? So if she's going to be there, what about this? And, and lest you think we can still use our K-1 visa, that K-1 visa means you have to marry here and you have to wait until you get your permanent residency to leave America. Now, permanent residency does not come in a week. It doesn't come in a month. It might come in a year, okay? And so there's really no chance of her being able to, to, to use that. And uh, it was a good experience filing all that paperwork. <laughs> So, so really, we only have two options, okay? The only two options are, like, you could wait for a whole other year. Like, who wants to do that? Like, that's crazy. So the, the better, the, what we chose is that, you know, we should get married in Korea, you know? And, uh, I, I, you know, God's provided me with the ability to make a living where I don't have to be living in the United States. You know, I can work remotely. So that, perfect, you know, that we're able to do that. And the, the one thing that we were not sure about at the time, as we're thinking about this, we're like, where are we going to live? What, what's, how, what, what are we going to do? You know, because you, you don't just rent an apartment in Korea like you can here. You don't just pay a monthly rent. You get like a big deposit money, you know, like $100,000, and you just give it to them. And then they use that money for like two years. And then when you want to leave, they give you back that money. I know that sounds really weird, but that's how it works, okay? Or you get a mortgage and you buy the house, okay? One of those two options. Uh, so, you know, because of that, uh, our thought was, well, maybe we can, and I know this is a bad thought, but maybe we can live with uh, her family, you know, in one room of the house. <laughs> I had a few problems with that, like thinking about like authority in the future, what about that, and you know, it's hard to get used to one person, let alone five other people, you know, who really aren't that interested in getting used to every quirk I have, you know. So we, we actually took our questions to the youth pastor, uh, Samuel Hoffman, he's the, the son of the pastor, and his wife, and we just kind of told him the situation and just to kind of see what they would think about it. And when he found out, at first he thought it was just two other people. And he's like, yeah, you could probably do that with just like a mo mom and grandma or something like that. And it might be okay. And then we found out there were five people going to live in the house besides us. He's like, that's crazy. You don't want to do that. That's a really bad idea. For the first year of marriage, what are you thinking? You know? <laughs> like, and then he said, but you know what? You know what? There's a missionary named Mr. Lemon. He, he's, he's got a big family. He's got seven kids. And two of his kids are going to be coming back to the U.S. And they're going to be, I think, going to university or something. And, and then he's coming back on basically deputation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but you basically go to different churches and you explain to them, basically churches that are already supporting you as a missionary. And um, so he was coming back and he's going to be here for a year, about a year and a half. And he has a house in, in Korea. And he was looking for somebody to take care of his house. Okay, but he hadn't found anybody yet, according to Sam. And uh, so I, you know, I texted, I texted Mr. Lemon right away, like within an hour of hearing that. I texted him like, hey, you know, this is our situation, you know, do you think we could stay in your house? <laughs> and so he brings us over, you know, like a week later, he brings us over and he's showing us the house and just like we're already going to stay there. Like he's just showing us around. And uh, I mean, th this is an amazing house, okay? And I well, I'll just read it now. You know, the Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Okay? I mean, this house is in the countryside. All right? It's, it's four bedrooms. It's two bathrooms. It's a big house. It's, it's got a solar panel. It's got a 450-foot well. You know? I mean, we're prepared for North Korea. You know? It's got fruit trees. 
of all different kinds around the yard. I mean, it's just like an amazing place that we never, ever thought we would ever have in, in that place. You know, never even thought about it. And yet, you know, God knew everything that was going to happen, and he was actually preparing this the whole time, I believe. You know, he, everything was prepared. He knew what was going to happen. And so, you know, Mr. Lemon, he's very happy to have us stay there, you know. And honestly, if I knew how to drew, drive a manual transmission, I would even have a car. I wouldn't even have to buy a car because he has a manual Jeep. But he's like, yeah, probably Korea's not a good place to learn how to drive a manual because there's a lot of hills and things. It's just very difficult. So I uh, probably won't have a car from him, you know, just to use. But uh, it's just, a, a, you know, a really great blessing. I mean, the, the house is like 15 minutes from the church, super close to the church. And um, as far as I know, I mean, it, it, we're, we don't even have to pay to stay there. It's just not, like, he just wants us to maintain the house, you know, just be there and maintain it. And, uh, you know, I, we were just blown away by that. You know, when we, when we found out that he was willing to let us do that, it was just like, what in the world? What, what did we do, you know, <laughs> to, to have any of this, you know, happen for us? So... You know, that, I mean, that's kind of the, that's the situation where we're at right now. I'm going to be going back um, this next Sunday uh, in the evening. I'll be flying back, uh, and our wedding will be November 18th. Um, you guys are invited? You coming? Come on, guys. <laughs> it's, all, it's just a short trip, so <laughs> it's only like 15-hour plane ride. Uh, babies do really well on 15-hour plane rides. <laughs> <laughs> Especially that many, right? They were, like all the kids. Yeah. So, anyways, you know, if you guys can come, we're gonna be recording things, so we'll have video and stuff. If you if you're interested in watching, you know, people are like, yeah, watch my wedding. Okay. <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's what has been going on, and just in summary, you know, I just want to say, I know you, maybe you're a bit overwhelmed with the things I've even said. It's too much stuff, but. Just thinking about the things I've said, you know, every step, God was aware. He provided everything that we needed when we needed it. You know, we didn't, we didn't have anything before we needed it, but, you know, he provided it when we needed it. Uh, it, w- it was dark before us. <laughs> We're just like walking along like, where are we going, you know? But, uh, you know, he knew what we needed. And uh, so let me just read you two um, passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 28. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Right? According to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And, you know, when I, when I read that verse, I think how many times we prayed for our visa to come in, you know, quickly, and so we could get back to America, get married, and we didn't know what we were praying for, you know. We didn't know according to the will of God, but the Spirit knew, and He knew what to pray according to the will of God, right? And everything worked out really well according to what He prayed. So, <laughs> and then the last verse I will read is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And uh, so let's just close in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for the provision that you've made in my life. And I pray that you would um, show yourself in that way to everybody here and uh, that you would just work in their lives. And I thank you for blessing us. I pray that we would continue to preach the gospel as, uh, as we can and help us not to be fearful or anything like that, but to make known your word. Uh, thank you for allowing us to come and gather here today. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.